Hello there, I'm David L. Gray from davidlgray.info here to respond to a myth that oftentimes Catholics hear from people who are anti-Catholics or people just, just ignorant about Christian history in general, about European history in general. And the myth goes something like this, that in 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire issued an edict that was called the Edict of Milan. And they say that this edict established Catholicism or Christianity as the official religion in the Roman Empire. And that in 325 AD, um, this Emperor Constantine, he called together um, all the Christians in this, at what was called the Council of Nicaea. And at that point in time, started a new religion that he called the Roman Catholic Church. And at that point in time, he also inserted some pagan beliefs into Christianity that, that wasn't there before. And that until his death, he was the head of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the myth. It goes something like that. Now, in this video, I'm going to offer you the 13 logical fallacies that can prove to you that that is a myth and that that isn't true. OK, but what how did Constantine arrive at that point in 313 A.D. to even issue this Edict of Milan that is the seed of this myth? Well, the story goes like this. In 312 A.D., outnumbered but determined, Constantine moved against Maxentius, marching his army down across the Alps at lightning speed. Maxentius drew up his forces along the Tiber River, some nine miles north of Rome. He was confident of victory, for he had received a prophecy, saying, On this day, the enemy of Rome shall perish. He took it as a good omen, for certainly God meant Constantine when he spoke of enemy of Rome. So confident was Maxentius that he made no plan for retreat. His only avenue was escape was over the narrow Milvian Bridge, which spanned the Tiber. Before the battle, Constantine had a dream or a vision. He saw a strange sign in the heavens and heard the words in Totoya Nikia, which in Greek is for in this conquer. The Latin is sometimes rendered in in hoc signo vinces, meaning in this sign you will conquer. Constantine ordered that a new imperial standard bearing that sign be made immediately and that the mysterious sign be painted on the shields of all his troops. The sign was formed from two letters, Chi and Rho, the first two letters of the title Christ in Greek. Though it was smaller, Constantine's army routed Maxentius' dispirited troops. They ran from the field, trying to retreat to the Milvian Bridge so many people were fleeing across the bridge that thousands were thrown into the river from the narrow span and died in a flood of waters of the Tiber. Massentius himself, the enemy of Rome, perished that day in the river. Constantine was victorious and was now the new Augustus of the Western Roman Empire together with his ally and brother-in-law Licinius, the Augustus of the East. The two Augusti joined in issuing a new edict of toleration, the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. This edict granted freedom of worship to all religious groups within the empire, making special mention of the Christians, saying, When you see that this has been granted to Christians by us, your worshipers will know that we have also conceded to other religions the rights of open and free observance of their worship for the sake of the peace of our times, that each one may have the free opportunity to worship as he pleases. This regulation is made that we may not seem to detract from any dignity of any religion. So that what you heard is the actual documented history, okay, not the myth. Now, let's get to these 13 points that will prove to you that this myth that Constantine started the Catholic Church is com completely illogical. It, it just, it's just stupid. Let's just be honest. It's just stupid. Okay, here we go. If Constantine started the Catholic Church, then it would therefore seem to follow that Constantine himself was a Catholic, which isn't the case. What emperor would make the official religion of his empire one thing, 
but he's not that thing or he's another thing. Okay, so there, there's no evidence, no document evidence that Constantine was ever um, Catholic during his lifetime. There is some evidence that maybe on his deathbed he's baptized into the faith, but that was at his deathbed. So during his life, during his reign, he was not a Catholic. Um, some people suppose that because the Catholic Church at that time um, had an issue baptizing people into the mysteries of Christianity who were soldiers, that soldiers can become Catholics because they were engaged in the art of killing people. And Christians at that time, Catholics at that time, were opposed to um, killing Okay, um, so some suppose, well, that's why Constantine didn't become a Catholic because he respected the faith and he knew he could become a Catholic, he could be baptized because he was engaged in killing people in battle. So, but Constantine was never a Catholic, so it doesn't make any sense that he would make the official religion of his empire one thing and he'd not be that thing. He wouldn't be that hypocrite. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, for Catholicism and Christianity, and I'm using these terms, Catholicism and Christianity, synonymous in this video. They mean the same thing. Okay, so, but for Catholicism to become the official religion of the Roman Empire, it would require an official act. It would, it would have required for the emperor to issue what was called an edict. It would not be something for Catholicism to be official religion. It wouldn't be something that Constantine would just say. Oh, the Catholic Church is the official religion. You know, it wouldn't be something he, he would just say or pass down word of mouth. No. It will have required an official government act of the empire to make that true. The problem is that we never see that edict during the lifetime of Constantine. He, he never issues that edict making Catholicism an official religion of the empire, even after the Council of Nicaea. We do not see that. All we see is in 3, 3, 3, 313 AD, which I read the Edict of Milan, which made Catholicism, which put Catholicism on equal footing with all the other religions of the empire, including Judaism and paganism, just on equal footing. It's just an a, a edict of religious toleration. Okay. Now we don't see Catholicism um, become the official religion of the empire by edict until 392 AD with Emperor Theodosius, who, who is a Catholic, by the way, unlike Constantine during his lifetime, Theodosius is a Catholic. He does issue an edict taking government support away from the pagan religions and putting the empire's full backing into Catholicism. So at 392, Catholicism does become the official religion of the empire in no time prior to is it officially so. Now, if by virtue of the Emperor Constantine establishing a new religion at Nicaea, convoking this council, calling all these bishops together, establish a whole new religion. Well, well, it means a few things. First, it means that, well, there had to be some sort of pre-existing religion prior to this. I mean, where did he find these bishops at? Where did, where did these bishops come from? Where did he find these people, um, these leaders to establish a new church? Okay, so there's, a, there's Nicaea and there's a pre-existing church, okay? But it also means this, which, which is more important, which, which makes this myth completely unbelievable, is that at Nicaea, the argument is that Constantine started his new religion, his Roman Catholic Church, and this, at this point in time, it starts a bunch of pagan beliefs into this religion. This religion moves forward, and that religion started a council of Nicaea, is the Catholic Church today. Okay. So what that means is that this new religion shouldn't have any continuity with the old religion, that this was just like a clean break, that things that we see the church believing after Nicaea was not the things they believed prior to. Okay, and I'm going to prove that false. All right. But also it means that the old religion, the pre-existing religion, the religion prior to Nicaea, if there is a clean break here, if there's a new thing established here at Nicaea, we shouldn't see anything um, that this pre-existing church holds with the Catholic Church today. That these two things are separate from one another. That they have no continuity. That there's a clean break between the old and the new. Okay. I'm also going to prove that false. I'm going to demonstrate this logical fallacy that the pre-existing church prior to Nicaea is a church at Nicaea. Okay, they're believing the same things they believe prior to, and also the Catholic Church today believes the same things that the prior church Nicaea believed, Nicaea and Nicaea believe that this is the same church. These three things are actually one. Watch this math. Here we go. Now, if by issuing an edict of that supposedly made Christianity the official religion at Roman Empire, and if by convoking a council to resolve some sort of controversy in that religion, if that is what means that Constantine started a, a new religion and that he was ahead of that religion until his death, if that, if that what that means, 
Then it would therefore seem to follow that every time Constantine issued an edict, or every time an emperor of Rome issued an edict about a religion, or that he stepped into a controversy in that religion to resolve it, whether it's pagan, whether it's Jewish or not, that it therefore means that he established that religion and that he was the head of it, or that religion became the official religion empire. Is that what that means? Because it can't be true. That only happened with Christianity. Because that's not the first time that the Roman Empire stepped into the issues of a, of, a, of a religion or that he issued an edict. So, but why is that the, why is that the argument just made with Catholicism? That this edict and that this council means this. Why doesn't it mean that same thing every other time the emperor of Rome stepped into a controversy and issued an edict? No, th this is only applied, this is just myopically applied, this is narrowly applied to Catholicism by anti-Catholics. And it's just illogical. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent. Now, the reason why the Council of Nicaea is convoked in the first place in 325 AD is because of a priest named Arius. Arius is going around and telling people and convincing people, making a convincing argument that Jesus was actually not divine, right? That he's not one with the Father. So this is causing a big issue in the Roman Empire. There was not peace between Catholics, okay? There, there's, the church was falling apart because this was, these were two counter beliefs. Well, well first of all, all right? For the council to be a vote to resolve a controversy like this, to resolve what some would call a heresy, well, it means that there, prior to this, there was a well-established belief in Catholicism. Okay, otherwise there can be a heresy. Okay, if there's this new thing that comes along that's that's causing controversy in the church, well, it means that there's an old thing, all right, that people believe that there's this well-established belief that's that's causing this issue. So it points to the fact that what Catholics believe about Jesus Christ being one with the Father, that He truly is God the Son, is an old belief. Okay, so it can be new. This the belief can be new that Jesus is truly God if there's a heresy that's coming along that's called causing controversy. So um, so this is why the council is convoked in the, in the first place. All right. And the pre-existing belief is the one that wins out. The well-established belief is the one that wins out and it's proven with a creed. The Council of Nicaea issues a creed that says in part that um, Jesus is God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, get this, consubstantial, mean one in being with the Father. Okay, so that's the well-established belief that, that wins out, and Ari, Arianism is pushed out. St. Nicholas at the council, you know, pimp smacks him in the face, you know, for this heresy, and he, he's jailed for that, okay? So, Arianism is still going to go on, um, for many decades, it's not going to be immediately resolved, but this is why the council is convoked. And the reason why this is, is important is, is, begin. it points to why this is a logical fallacy. It doesn't make any sense. If I had the council of Nicaea, well, if what was established was a new thing, okay, then why would the old thing continue? This belief about Jesus being consubstantial with the Father is what is old. That's what's well established. And that's what goes forward. Okay. Now, if at this council, Arianism became the official belief, okay, then we could say the Council of Nicaea started a new thing because Arianism was, was relatively new. And if the council did that and moved forward, then it would be a new thing. In fact, we can say that there are some, some churches in the world today that rejected the creed. And they did continue on. Those religions are new things. And we see that belief that Jesus isn't truly, she isn't truly divine, that he's just human, that he's not truly God. We see that in other religions. Um, principally, we see that in Islam. And again, the fact that at the Council of Nicaea, the Emperor Constantine was able to gather together bishops and leaders throughout the Roman Empire means that there was a well-established church prior to the Council of Nicaea, with some very old and established beliefs. And we see this, we can document this, we can prove this, that even prior to Nicaea, all these churches throughout the Roman Empire, um, I believe some, some of the same things that, that all of them believe. Um, first of all, that at the Mass, um, the, the communion, bread and wine, truly become the actual flesh 
and the actual blood of Jesus Christ. They all believe that. We also see that they all believe that the Bishop of Rome is the successor of Peter and that he is the head of the Universal Catholic Church. All these churches also agreed on many books of the New Testament. They weren't all in agreement yet about which books were inspired and which books were apostolic, but they were in general agreement about like 95% of the books that we that today we call the New Testament. So it's illogical to say that at Nicaea, what was established a new thing when a bunch of old things were brought in and those things went forward from that point. Now, 218 years before the Council of Nicaea, there was a bishop of the Church of Antioch. His name was Ignatius. We call him Saint Ignatius today. And he wrote a letter to one of his churches that bishops do. This was the Church of Smyrna. And he wrote them a letter in which he used the word Catholic, which proves that here in the early, in the late first century, early second century, the church was called Catholic. This, this was the church in Antioch where Christian, where those who followed Jesus were first called Christians. In his same diocese, they were first called Catholic. He says this in his letter. He says, Wheresoever the bishop shall appear, let the people also be. As Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. In that same letter, St. Ignatius wrote something that only the Catholic Church believes today about the Holy Eucharist. And this is very important to prove that at Nicaea, a new thing was not established. Okay, this is an old thing because only the Catholic Church today believes that at communion, at the Mass, as I said, the bread and wine truly become the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That was believed before Nicaea. It was believed after Nicaea, and it's believed today only by the Catholic Church. In that letter, he writes this. They abstain from the Eucharist and from the public offices because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father of his goodness raised again from the dead. And for this cause contradicting the gift of God, they die in their disputes. But much better would it be for them to receive it, that they might one day rise through it. And what is St. Ignatius here? He's, he's pointing to the promise that Jesus Christ said in John 6, that, that the eternal Father first established in Exodus 12. And the promise was this, the first Passover command was to eat the, the flesh of the lamb, to put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, and you will be passed over. Your firstborn would not be struck down as God struck down the Egyptians. This is the promise he made to the Jews in Exodus. And he said, he told him, this command would be forever. It would be a perpetual command. Jesus fulfills his command in himself by pointing to himself, saying, I am that bread of life drink my blood, eat my flesh. And in John, he says, it will give you, in John chapter six, he says, and it will give you eternal life if you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Catholics believe that. Paul believed in Corinthians. He, he says it. He says, it's not the, the cup we drink, the participation in the blood of Christ. It's not the, the bread we eat. Uh, uh, do we not eat his flesh when we do that? Paul says it. Christians throughout for the past 2,000 years have said it. This thing that only Catholics believe. So Catholicism is not a new thing that was established at Rome by Constantine. It's an old thing, a pre-existing thing that has went on from the beginning until now. 170 years before the Council of Nicaea, a person who we call today St. Justin the Martyr, Okay, because he was martyred. His name was Justin, and he's a saint. Wrote a letter to the emperor um, Antonius Pius, explaining what Christians did at Mass, saying this: On the day we call the day of the sun, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as much as time permits. 
When the reader has finished, he who presides over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. What he's talking about here is a sermon or a homily. Then we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves and for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments, so that so as to obtain eternal salvation. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange a kiss. He's talking about the kiss of peace that we still see at Mass as the sign of peace. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for a considerable time, he gives thanks to God. Again, we're talking about the Eucharistic prayers that we still see at Mass today. Um, that we have been given, that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. Okay, When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present give a voice to acclamation, saying, Amen. Same thing we see at Mass today in the liturgy. When he resides, has given thanks, and the people have responded, those whom we call the deacons, to give those present the Eucharist, the bread and wine, and after, take them to those who are absent. So here, 170 years before the Council of Nicaea, we see the Mass. We see the liturgy of the Mass that you still see today at the Catholic Church. You see the Eucharistic prayers. You see the sign of peace. You see the deacons distributing the Eucharist. You see, you see them taking it to the people who aren't there. It's the same thing that goes on to the Mass today. So Nicaea could, not have, could have established a new thing if we still see that same thing today. Now, again, I'm, I'm taking you through this, this time machine. I hope, you, I hope you've been following. I'm taking you through a time machine to show you that what the Catholic Church believes today, we've always believed. That there wasn't a new thing established, and I see it. That what we believe today is what we always believe. Now we're 136 years before the Council, and I see it. And we're about to run into a guy named St. Irenaeus. He was a bishop over the Diocese of Lyons. Now, Irenaeus was actually a disciple of a gentleman named Polycarp. If you don't know Polycarp, read about Polycarp. He was an awesome Catholic before he became a pagan. All right. Now, Polycarp, he was a disciple of the Apostle John. So we're talking about people who either knew Jesus or people who knew those who knew Jesus. Now, Irenaeus, he writes his letter to his churches saying this. But since it would be too long to enumerate in such a volume as this, the secession of all the churches, we can found all those who in whatever matter, whether through self-satisfaction or vainglory or through blindness and wicked opinion, assembled other than where is proper by pointing out here the secessions of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome, by, by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, that the church which has the tradition and the faith which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles with that church because of its superior origin, all the churches must agree. That is all the faithful in the whole world and it is in her that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition. So he's addressing those people who dare to gather in churches outside of the Church of the Apostles established by Peter and Paul. He's writing this letter 136 years before the Council of Nicaea, pointing to Rome, pointing to Peter and his successors. There's not a new thing established in Nicaea. This is an old thing, and it is the thing that we still have with us today is a church established by Jesus Christ through his apostles, a church called Catholic, first at Antioch, and today called the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Not the Roman Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. That, that's Theologically, that's an error. We have only been called, we have only called ourselves the one holy and Catholic and apostolic church. That's who we are. And that's a church that has always been here from the beginning 
until now. Now, if it's true, if it's, if it's true that this myth that we heard, that, that Constantine started the Catholic Church, then there should be no way that we can prove, there, there should be, be, be no paper trail by which we can document and prove that our bishops today can trace themselves back to the very first churches in their diocese. There should be a clean break sometime after Nicaea started. We should see a break. There, there should be a clear break between a pre-existing church and a church today, right? That's logically, that's, that, that should be the case. We should be able to document and prove that a bishop today, but, but that's not the case. We can tell you every bishop that there ever has been of the church in Rome, of the Catholic Church in Rome. We know every single bishop from Peter until the Pope today. We know who they are. We know their names. The same with the church, the Catholic Church in Antioch, the Catholic Church in Jerusalem, the Catholic Church in Egypt, all the ancient Catholic churches. We know every single one of their bishops. We see the successive pattern. We see the apostolic succession from, from bishop to bishop, from priest to priest, down through the lines, the successive from one generation to another, all connected with one another through this apostolic succession. We see it. We have the paper trail. We can document it. There is no break. There is no no thing, new thing. There is an old thing that has continued throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia. It is the one holy Catholic apostolic church. All right, let's hop back into the time machine one more again. Now, if the Council of Nicaea right, was the first time the bishops were called together to resolve disputes, then we shouldn't see any other time prior to the council that I see it where bishops gather together in council to resolve controversies or to um, solidify their unity with one another. That's not the case now. Granted, Nicaea was the first time that all the bishops from all these different dioceses throughout the, the Roman Empire came together in one what we call an ecumenic, ecumenical council. But Let's go through the time machine. Let's see these other councils because to, to solidify that this is a well-established belief. In, in 285 AD, we see the councils of Carthage. Now this is their seventh council in 256 um, uh, AD. So it means they had six other councils before us, but in 256 AD, what is this, what is around like what, 75 years prior to the Council of Nicaea? They have, they issue one of their canons that they issue at this council says this, get this. It says, heretics who are called antichrist and adversaries of Christ, when they come to the church, must be baptized with the one baptism of the church so that friends may be made of adversaries and Christians of Antichrist. All right, there, there we see it right there, all right? So there's a council stating that the church believes in this one baptism, all right? Um, another example is in the Council of Elvira in Spain in 300 AD, okay? So 25 years before the Council of Nicaea, where were 19 bishops and 26 priests, and 19 bishops, and 26 priests and deacons gathered together and issued 81 canons, which means these people, they agreed on 81 things? That was a lot of things to agree on, right? They must have some unity here. There must have been some well-established belief in place already for them to just come together and agree. Okay, this is true, okay. Yep, yep, that's true too, okay. If these were new beliefs in 300 AD when it's council together, what if they wouldn't agreed on 81 things? No, that they agreed on 81 things proves that there are some well-established beliefs in place that they could just come together. But, yep, I agree, that's true. Now, th this is one thing that they agreed on. This is Canon 16 saying, heretics. This is, this is a word that, that the old churches usually love. I wish we would still use this word, heretics. Let's just call things what they are, heretics, all right? It's not a, it's not a bad thing to say the truth, heretics. If they do not wish to come over to the Catholic Church or not to be given Catholic girls in marriage. So, so here we have it, this belief that Catholics have always believed that Catholics should marry Catholics. Just, just for a good reason. 
because so we can raise the children of the marriage in the faith so there's not any disputes so kids aren't being raised in, in the catholic church and then some sort of pagan religion the, the family units is essential for the future whenever there was a breakdown of the faith in the family it, it just it, it affects generations just just generations and so this is something catholics has always believed and here something that we really barely enforce today but here is something that is enforced very strongly all right they are not to be given catholic girls in marriage if they aren't catholic so so how could have constantine have started a new religion in in 385 in 325 AD if there's clearly this pre-existing religion it is documented okay my friends and my comrades can, can we just get to the plain air of this whole thing I mean I, I saved this one for last because it's really just the most obvious I could have let in with this but I just wanted to to get you to, to this point all right I, I think the most obvious the most plain air of this whole thing this whole myth that Constantine started the Catholic Church is the fact that it's not documented that Constantine started the Catholic Church <laughs> it's not documented that Constantine started a new thing. It's, it's not. And the problem is that the Romans were obsessive. They were compulsive. They were aficionados about documenting their history. And guess what? If Constantine started a new religion, if he started a new thing at the Council of Nicaea, and that if what you say is true, that Constantine was the head of the Catholic Church until his death, if that was true, guess what? It would have been documented because that would have been a big deal. The Romans somewhere, some historian of Rome would have said that, just would have, and we, we would have, there would be some paper trails, some sort of proof, some sort of coin, some sort of image. I mean, there, there would be something just to prove something even close to this, but we don't have anything that, e that even hints to this. I mean, I mean, this is this is ridiculous. I mean, I'm up here talking in a high pitched voice now because I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I just don't know what to say anymore. I mean, I just don't. <laughs> I mean, it's just silly. It's just illogical. You, you can't prove it in no shape or form. I've taken you through the time machine. I mean, my time machine is out of gas now because we made so many stops. I, I've shown you, I've shown you the proof. I've shown you the evidence that it's a myth, that it's not true, that the Catholic Church, I mean, I mean, come on. Now we know who founded every religion, every religion. We know who founded Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam. We know who founded every Protestant denomination there is, and there's many, from, from the Lutheran church, we know who founded that, to up Joel Osteen's church, we know who founded that. That church probably down the street from you called, um, I don't know, um, Just Woke Up Church. We know who founded that church, okay? We don't know because there's no man who has ever said he founded the Catholic Church. Constantine didn't say it. Peter didn't say it. Paul didn't say it because they couldn't. Because Jesus Christ established his church through his apostles with Peter as the head of the apostles. We know that. We see it in Acts. That church that Christ established, they began baptizing people into. That church. That church um, the Christians in Antioch were first, they were first called Christians there, okay? In Antioch, we see them being called Catholic there. That church continues, that church is persecuted for, for centuries, yet that church continues to persevere and hold tight. They, they continue, to, continue to celebrate the Mass. They continue to read the writings of the Apostles. That church, he has gathered at the Council of Nicaea, to 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 squash this heresy and to solidify what it is that we Catholics believe about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That church goes on. Yes, it eventually becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire in 392 AD. But prior to that, that church finally established that, okay, these are our scriptures. This is our Bible. This church is not a, a Bible-based church. It's not. It's a church that has a Bible that's based upon it, that's based upon his mass, that's based upon his worship, okay? Because this church existed centuries before it put this Bible together. And that church continues on throughout the centuries, producing saints after saints after saints. This is a church that can document that its members, if they live a, live a faithful life, they do go to heaven. We know that because these saints have documented, documented again, I keep saying this word, documented, miracles that prove that they are in heaven. 
this church proves that what it says about the whole Eucharist is true. It has miracles to prove it. it has the evidence documented. This, this church continues until today. So it is a myth that you need to let go that Constantine started this church because he did not. No one ever said he did. He never said he did because he did not. This church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, not the Roman Catholic church, the one holy and Catholic and apostolic church was established by Jesus Christ through his apostles. And it's that church that if you call yourself Christian, Christ is calling you to be in unity with. You really don't have a real choice if that's the truth. All right, well, thanks for watching this video. Um, if you'd like to read a longer essay about this topic that I wrote, um, visit me online at davidlgray.info. I'll put a link to that essay down in the um, description of this video below. But yeah, visit me online. Make sure you subscribe, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I make a lot of good content. I like you to be updated when I'm, I'm putting new stuff out here. Um, I'm on some social media platforms. You can see some here. Make sure you follow me. And as always, I'm looking forward to your comments below. I really am. look forward to hearing from you, whether you, you like what I, I said or you didn't. You know, I like the dialogue. I like to interact with you guys about what you're thinking, whether you appreciate what I'm doing or not, um, that helps a lot. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of time, you know, make these videos. And I have a, a real job. I don't get paid a lot of money for these these YouTube things, um, barely even gas money. <laughs> so I always appreciate when you guys let me know that my, my time and my effort is worth it. I really do. And, um, but until then, until next time, blessings and shalom to you and to yours.